Psalms chapter number 68. Come read one verse. It might take us longer than 25 minutes to get through that one verse, Brother Randy, but verse number 19. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. Now, that Selah means go back and think about it, so we're going to read it again. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving the opportunity to come to your house tonight, Lord. Lord, we're thankful for the songs and for the testimonies. Lord, I pray that you'd hide this unworthy vessel behind the cross. Lord, I pray that you'd lift up the name of your son, that you'd draw men to him, and that you'd help them tonight. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, if you study English, you know that commas oftentimes can be used to add something to a thought, but if you take it out, the verse still stands by itself. Look at verse number 19 again. Blessed be the Lord, comma, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Now, you, this might be Brother Jordan's commentary, but I can read this verse, see the psalmist, blessed be the Lord, even the God of our salvation. That's still true. But halfway through penning at the Holy Ghost snuck up on this guy and said, hey, He's not just the God of your salvation. He's the God that every day loadeth you with benefits. It'd be one thing if God saved you. Hallelujah. He deserves to be praised whether He saved you or He didn't save you because He's holy. But not only did He save you, daily He loadeth you with benefits. Now, I've talked about this verse before. I read a message that Spurgeon preached blew my mind. But really, he spends a lot of time getting into what daily he loadeth us with benefits, it means. And really, it'd be as if you had a cart. And in that cart, you've got everything that God blessed you with. you got all of your problems. you got all of the burdens that God's given you. And then, God fills it up with benefits so much, on top of all of that, that if God blessed you anymore, you wouldn't be able to bear that cart. You wouldn't be able to pull it. How good is God to He's so good to you that if He was any gooder, right? That's a Brother Bobby Cato word. But if He was any gooder, you wouldn't be able to stand it. If God poured out on you any more than He already has, you wouldn't be able to function. Daily, He loadeth you with benefits. Loadeth. That means there's no space that's left unoccupied means that you can't turn around and find a spot where there aren't benefits that He's given to you. Loadeth you with benefits. Even the God of our salvation. Not some random guy down the street. Not some Bill Gates or benefactor that gave to you because he has a whole lot more than he ever knows what to do with. No. The God that loved you and bought you with the very blood of His only begotten Son loadeth you with benefits because of that love that He has for you. Then He says, Selah, think about that. So I start thinking about that. I think about this verse a lot. But, if you're blessed, you have a job. God has given you an opportunity to where He can meet your needs and at the same time, you can shine as a light where God puts you. You're blessed if you have a job. You're blessed if that job pays you well. But you're really blessed if that job comes with benefits. See, when you got saved, you were given newness of life. He promised that if any man come unto him, you know why it's cast him out. He promised that if any man be in him, he's a new creature. And he promised that he was the way, the truth, and the life. He rebirthed you in newness of life, and now you get to live with him for all of eternity. That was the promise of salvation. Everything else, that's a benefit. Everything that doesn't involve you being forgiven of your sins and getting to go to glory for all of eternity, that's icing on the cake. Well, daily he loadeth us with benefits. But Phil, there were some people at work this week that were shocked to find out that Mazak every year gives them $80 in a shoe voucher because we don't work on a shop floor. Right, I sit at a desk. I'm not, I'm not a welder, I'm not a fabricator, I'm not the guy putting the machine together. But even I, 
get $80 every year to go towards new boots. I don't need steel toe boots. Guess where my $80 went this year? Nowhere. I didn't go to the boot truck when it showed up this week to go get me some steel toes. I didn't, but it's a benefit. There are also people that when they got into the employee handbook to see where that was in it, they also found out that Mazak gives them uh, allowance, I think it's $120 every year to go out and buy safety glasses. Right? Well, I'm not around sharp objects that are flying through the air all the time. right? I'm lazy, I sit in a chair. I don't need those. But it's a benefit of my employment. They also found out that Mazak will pay $25 every month if you can prove that you go, which is why I don't even bother with it because I wouldn't go. But if you prove that you go to the gym, they'll pay $25 a month for a gym membership. It's a benefit. Yeah. Whole point, that's not dependent on me showing up and doing my job. That doesn't come out of my pay. That's something on top of my employment. It is a benefit. But see, so many Christians, our pastor said it this way, so many Christians live far below, far below their privileges as a child of God. Well, there's a whole lot of benefits that I don't take advantage of at work. But there's a whole lot of benefits that Christians aren't taking part in that God's already paid, provided, and He's made sure that you can receive it, but yet, they don't get used. Well, if all that work has gone into it, surely God thinks that you ought to use it. And we just heard tonight, remind me, Lord. So with the Lord's help, we're going to remind you. But with the Lord's help, we're going to preach tonight on loaded, but lazy. We're loaded with benefits. You know why Brother Jim Jordan doesn't go to the gym? Because he's lazy. That's why that benefit that I have as part of my employment is not going to get used. But, you know why I don't use the benefit for the shoes? Because I don't need them. One of these days, if at, you know, it accrues every year, I'm sure it'll hit a cap at some point. But I may go to the boot truck. May get me a pair of steel toe boots, even though I've never had a pair before in my life. Why? Because they're free. Free is the best price. But in all honesty, Christians loaded with benefits, yet they live like they're miserable in the world. Why? Because they're not using the benefits that God's already given them access to. We've got Christians walking around, you know, feeling like they're lower than a snake's belly. Well, according to him, you're robed in his righteousness. You're a joint heir with him. You've got a place that he's already prepared for you. And in one of these days, the Bible tells me you're going to get to sit in his very throne with him. God thinks very highly of you. Amen. And His benefits reflect that. Sure. But, we're loaded with benefits, but why don't they get used? Because we're lazy. If they've already been provided and they're not being used, it's not God's fault, it's our fault. Amen. It's either you don't know about them, like some of them people on the job this week, or you know about them, you may have forgotten about them, but the reason they don't get used is because you've never embraced it, received it, made it a part of your life. So as I was thinking, there's no way we're going to get through all these points, so we're going to get as far as God says to get, and then we're going to stop. But the first benefit, we take it for granted. Every day, I dare say. But the first benefit is that you have a preserved copy of the very words of God. Study it out. In order for you to have what you have today, for thousands of years, God was faithful because He promised that His Word would be established. He made a way through much adversity, through much tribulation, through the world trying to get rid of every piece of evidence that God ever did anything for man and preserved it all the way from when Moses started pinning it down, long before that when the traditions were handed down from the patriarchs and the history was preserved. And once it was committed to page, they didn't have PDF copies. In order for it to be preserved, somebody had to diligently, they were called the scribes, rewrite those pages because they were put on to sheets of animal parchment or they were put on to you know, papyrus that doesn't matter how good you take care of it, one day it's going to fall apart. Right, right. And they recopied it and retranscribed it until you get to the point today 
that you can hop on Google, order a KJV, and it can be there with Amazon, two-day shipping. If you're a Prime member, free two-day shipping. We don't give it a second thought. There was a time that the only place you could hear the Word of God was showing up at the synagogue. You didn't have a copy to take home with you. The only thing you took home with you was what the Lord impressed upon your heart, what you were able to commit to memory. But no, God has given you the privilege of having everything He ever said. He said there's a half that hadn't been told, but the half that has been told, you've got it in your lap. Every, you want to know what God thinks about anything? It's in here. Now, it's part of that word. One of the benefits are the promises of God. We just heard about them. We are blessed to know that God has made promises to If God had made the promise and you didn't know about it, God's still going to keep it. But it's one thing to know that somebody made you a promise. That is an anchor for your soul. That is a blessed hope to know that it's impossible for God to lie and that God specifically made those promises to you. He didn't make them to a group of people. He made them individually to you. In fact, the Bible says every day He renews His promises to you. I don't know what time in God's calendar, because it's always daytime, but I don't know at what point in a day God in heaven sets aside Jordan, but He remakes those promises to me individually. You say, you believe that? That's what the Bible says. I don't know when He does it, don't know how He does it, but I believe He does it. And before I get up out of bed every morning, God's already promised again all those promises that are in His Word. But they don't do you any good if you don't know about them. It's a benefit. Now, everybody loves the promise that He'll meet your needs, which He will. Hallelujah. He said, you don't have to worry about food, clothing, raiment. All the stuff that you need, He's going to take care of it. But we forget that promise that having food and raiment to be content therewith. Right? We start to think that we need all these other things. God said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know what, how important this Bible is if you don't embrace it? And the goal is not to know it as good as Brother Duck or Brother Jordan or Brother Josh, or Brother Ron, or Brother Clint, who's been here for five decades, almost. We don't want to make you sound older than you are. Almost five decades. Not good enough to know it as good as the desire that a true child of God has is to know the Word of God as God knows the Word of God. Because He knows every jot and tittle. In fact, when Jesus came, He's promised to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law left no stone unturned right, and he knows every in and out of all the promises that he made to you do you yes. we like to think about that he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother sure. hallelujah yes. but it's also just as true as he says over in Malachi to try him to bring the tithes into the storehouse and see if he won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you right. Right. just as true just as true as the promise that the judgment that you meet out is what God's going to use to judge you. Yeah. We like the fuzzy promises, but God also makes promises that if you do, you will reap. Yeah. And He tells you exactly what you're going to reap. Right. And because people have forgotten those promises, they go out and they live like the world not knowing that God's promise there's going to be a payday. Yeah. Right. Not where they're going to have to receive payment, they're going to have to pay God for the way that they lived after they got saved. He has promised that everyone that has ever lived is going to have to stand before God in one or two judgment seats and give an account of what they did. If they were lost, they're going to have to give an account of their sins. If they were saved, they're going to have to give an account of every deed they did from the day they got saved until they went home to be with the Lord. It's promised. And if God promised it, it's impossible for God to lie. They promised that if you try Him, you're always going to find out that He is what He said He would be. God wants you to trust Him so much that He's promised. I don't know how many times. I didn't go through and count them all. 
But he has promised if you test him, or if you try him, if you put your faith in him, it's never going to be in vain. Why did he have to promise that? Because like Brother Don said, we're human and we forget. We got to wrestle with this flesh every day. I got to deal with a mind that's not perfect and can't remember. But I have found if you put this in, he's able to bring it back to your remembrance. But not only do we have the promises, we've got God's parameters. The very parameters or the very requirements, the expectations of God. So many people go through this world and they go nuts. They pull their hair out, they're on medication because they have no idea how to be successful in life and they're trying to figure it out on their own. God has given you every requirement in the eyes of God to be successful, to be prosperous, and to be an image of His Son. But see, not only do we find the requirements, we also find the expectations. You know what God expects out of you? Be ye holy for I am holy. Be ye conformed to the image of His Son. You were bought with the price. Your life is no longer your own. He expects you to be willing not only to be put on the potter's wheel, but also to go into the fire, to be hardened, to go into the kiln. He knows that it won't be easy. That's why I promised that we just talked about. He's going to be there with you. We know what it takes to find favor in the eyes of God. Some people are just too lazy to do it. Now, if it was available and you don't partake in it, it's one of two reasons. You didn't know about it or you think you don't need it. Why didn't I go get work shoes off of the work truck or the boot truck this week? Because I don't need steel toe shoes. Now, I say that and then watch. God's going to, you know, laugh at my ignorance, wink at my ignorance, and then something's going to fall on my foot this week and I'm going to wish I had steel toe boots. But the credit wasn't big enough to pay for them. We'll wait until they're free. Anyway. I'm not around woodcutting or welding where there's metal and, you know, splinters and everything else flying around. I got a pair of them cheapo safety glasses. If I need to, I'll throw them on. But if every day I was looking at something that could fly up and blind me, I'd have used the glasses credit to go out and get safety glasses. But I don't think I need it. But why don't Christians live the way that God says that they ought to live? Because they think they don't need to. See, over in the book of Ecclesiastes, I find that Solomon increased in wisdom, and as he increased in wisdom, he also increased in sorrow. The more he learned, the heavier his heart got, because he was more discouraged the more that he saw that all man did. Because man tried so many different ways on their own. And in every way, he said that vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He knew the right way, but he was trying to figure out why in the world won't people just do what God says? He calls himself the preacher in Ecclesiastes. What's he preaching to him? You've got a whole bunch of foolishness in your life. And you need to junk it. He says there's nothing new under the sun. They didn't have Bitcoin and they didn't have all the things that we got nowadays. But man is still man. And they can call it whatever they want, but it all boils down to this. They're trying to make something of nothing. And it may stand for a thousand years, a hundred years, ten years. may not make it a week. But eventually it all goes back to nothing. The Egyptians have built them great pyramids. What are they today? Big rocks. They're nothing. All those valleys of the kings that they go and they excavate things, you know where they had to, why they had to excavate it? Because it was covered up with a whole bunch of sand. It was turned into nothing. God has a way of showing you that all your hard work was for naught. Then time is the great equalizer. One day in eternity, everybody's going to look back and say, I wish I would have done more. Wish that I would have learned more, listened more, done more. You've got everything that God expects of you. He shows you how to do it. And any promise that what you couldn't do, He would do for you. He doesn't expect you to make yourself into the image of Christ. He knows you can't do it. He promised He'd do that part. He just expects us to yield. To let Him take control in our life. 
But see, we don't just have the promises. We don't just have the parameters. We've got some past examples. This Word of God, the Old Testament was given to us as our schoolmaster. They were given to us as our end sample. The New Testament, literally, Jesus' ministry, but also there's people that you can learn from, past examples. It breaks my heart, Brother Tommy, when people put so much, or when God's people put so much faith and trust in people that they get hurt by Alexander's, the coppersmiths. And they get hurt by Demas and Diotrephes. God says, let God be true and every man a liar. But yet, time after time, people never learn, Brother Ron. And it's easy. It's easy to like people. It's easy to let people become a part of your life. Why do you think God gave us the church? Because He knew that people needed people. But when you put people on a pedestal, people can hurt you. And so many examples of God's people being hurt because they esteemed others higher than they ought to have. And when it happens, it's because one of two things. They didn't know about the examples, which shame on us for not instructing the new generation. Or they had heard about it, but they thought that it would never happened to them. We've got the benefit of knowing everything that God said. And in His providence, He gave us examples. Showed us those that did right and those that did wrong. And either you can learn from it on the page or you're going to have to learn it the hard way through life. So many scars and bumps and bruises that the children of God have from the world. I wonder how many of them could have been avoided if we'd have just learned the lesson off the page. If we'd have been humble enough to say, God, you know better than I do. And you pinned it down for a reason. Apply that to my heart. Make it a part of me. He said, the Word became flesh, John chapter number 1. The Word's as much a part of God as anything else that is God. But what does He expect of His children? He expects you to make the Word a part of you. It's a benefit that you can have all of it sitting in your lap at one time. You don't have to wait for another revelation or another prophecy. You don't have to wait for another letter from an apostle written to your local church so that you can hear what else God wants you to have. You've got it all. And yet, so much of it sits by the wayside. I know First and Second Chronicles isn't fun to read. So-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And Numbers and Leviticus, thou shalt and thou shalt not. But God preserved it for a reason. If you don't understand, just ask God, hey, Lord, what do you want me to get out of this? Now, we've got to go on the next point. But not only do we have the preserved Word of God, we have what I believe is the most underused benefit that a child of God has. It's the person of the Holy Ghost. You have been blessed. Jesus, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'm getting ready to but Jesus said he must go away so that the Comforter, capital C, can come. Jesus said it's better for me to go and you to get the Holy Ghost than for Jesus himself to still be robed in flesh walking on this earth. So Jesus thought pretty highly of the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost came and sealed you and indwells in you. You are the tabernacle of God if you've been saved. You don't go anywhere without Him. You don't think about anything without Him knowing what it is. Everything that you do, God's just as much a part of as you are. Because He's a part of you. But because of that possession, God didn't buy you and say, oh, I'll be by later to pick you up. He said, nope, I got you now. You're in His hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. No man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? He got you good. That's why our hope is anchored within the veil. We couldn't go there, but he already did. He's holding on on that side of glory and on this side of glory to make sure that you don't lose what he gave to you. But see, that's part of the mechanism of you getting saved is the Holy Ghost moving in. What's the benefit? There's so many. The benefits of the person of the Holy Ghost. 
First one, discernment. Big, big fancy, complicated doctr doctrinal word. All that means is, is, you know, when the Holy Ghost is talking and when the Holy Ghost isn't talking. And it means that you can discern or understand what it is that he's trying to say to you. How do you develop that relationship? Well, it takes work. Right? Ella Rose is going to show up sometime. Okay? But when she shows up, she's not going to understand English. She's going to understand crying and food. That's about it. Okay, when if we were to drop you off in, I think it's somewhere close to 65% of the world, people don't even understand, have any understanding or comprehension of the language English. You would have to discern a whole new language. But when God moved in, God knew exactly how to talk to you. But you didn't know how to listen to what it was that God was trying to tell you. It takes effort. It takes work. You've got to get some flashcards. Right? You've got to learn how to spell things a little bit. You've got to understand how it is that God talks to you. But then you have to understand what God's trying to tell you. Discernment is the mechanism by which you get into the Word of God and it makes sense to you at all. The Word is spiritually discerned. I mean, everybody knows what the, everybody that's been saved knows what the Holy Ghost's voice sounds like because that's what drew them to salvation. One of his responsibilities in what the Bible teaches about the Holy Ghost is that he is the mechanism by which God convicts you. You didn't get convicted without understanding that God was telling you you were a sinner and that he was telling you you needed to be saved. If you understood that when you got saved... It's just as easy to understand what he's saying after you get saved. But discernment comes as a result of one, practice. But two, it comes as a result of patience. You guys remember when Elijah was led to a cave by the Lord? First off, he just had a meal that lasted him 40 days. Right? But he gets to a cave and there was a whirlwind. There's lightning thunderings. God wasn't in any of that. But he was in a still small voice. If Elijah had left after the whirlwind, after the thunderstorm, he'd have never heard God's voice. Too often we expect discernment all the time. You'll hear from God when God wants to talk to you. And most of the time, it's not that God won't talk to you. It's that you're not in the position you need to be in order to hear from God yet. God doesn't speak if nobody's listening. Go study out the history of Israel. When they had no interest in God, God would let them go to their own devices. But yet, He was always faithful to raise up a man, a prophet, to remind them of what they had once known to be true. But even then, they had to choose to listen. John the Baptist was the voice out in the wilderness preaching up a storm. Wilderness was outside of town. So how do you have all them followers? Somebody had to go out and hear them. They had to choose to be positioned, but then to be patient to hear. Well, John, why aren't you preaching? God didn't say to preach yet. God said there's some that's still waiting. We need to wait for them to get here before the preaching can start. But the same is true in your life. You don't hear from God because you want to hear from God. You hear from God when you're ready to hear from God. Discernment takes being principled. You can't think like the world, live like the world, and expect God to show up and tell you what it is that you need. But if you can discern the Holy Ghost, you get a lot of direction. Not just this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do. Every now and then I feel him, him yank on them reins and say, eh, hey, don't say that. Don't go down that way. Something's off about this. You might just want to sit back a second and let things play out a little bit for you, offer up your opinion. All right, Lord. But there are also times that as a result of discernment, you get some of the most sweet fellowship 
that you could ever have with God. When you get so low that you finally realize that all you have is God, He's there to show up and remind you that that's all you need. He can speak to you in a way that no man, that no preacher, that no mother, no father, no brother, no sister can speak to you. He can speak directly to your soul. And when that part of your soul is shaking in its boots because it doesn't know which way to go, He's got a way to show up and say, Peace, be still, like we heard this morning. Amen. It's all going to be alright. You don't hear that if you don't have discernment. But see, that direction, how much heartache, how much you know, vexation, how much of what we deal with every day could be avoided if people just listen to the Holy Ghost I get that we live in a sin cursed world but show me where the Apostle Paul was apologetic for ever being saved regardless of all that he went through right. yet there are some people that they go through a molehill not a mountain not a great storm out on the sea where the boat's filled up with water but they just hit a bump in the road and all of a sudden it's doom and gloom because their favorite thing on the dashboard tipped over and now it's got a scratch on it. They'll pull the car over, they'll take it to the mechanic, and they will complain to everybody that they know. But yet there are those that, if they got a little bit of discernment, maybe God lets you hit the bump in the road to readjust your focus. You ever been behind the wheel and all of a sudden you get to thinking about something and the last thing on your mind is whether that's light, red, yellow, or green? You're tuned out. Well, maybe the bump in the road was to tune you back in. Amen. Discernment, understand. Thank you, Lord, for bringing my attention back to where it needs to be. Thank you for readjusting where my focus was. He knows exactly how to get your attention. He knows exactly when to speak, how to speak. He knows how to speak in the way that you can understand exactly what God wants you to understand. He doesn't talk over your head and He doesn't talk to you like you're dumb. He talks to you like He loves you. And as a result of it, you get the best direction. Now I get, hopefully all this, I've got, got 401k plans, got health insurance plans, got things to prepare for a bad day. Because the Bible does say, no man knoweth what a day brings forth. You know what you need to know? What God tells you every morning. What He shows you throughout the day. Because left to your own devices, no man knows what a day brings forth. You've got no idea how to get from here to the end of the day without the very blessings of God being manifest in your life. The Bible says by him and through him do all things consist. If Jesus took one second off and everything in the world didn't spin out of orbit, but things kept on going, you wouldn't be able to remember who you were, where you came from, or where you headed. Right, right. All those faculties are because he is who he is. Yeah, right. So if he bought you, what in the world makes you think that he would have left it up to you to figure out how to get where he told you to get? He gave you the Holy Ghost for that purpose to lead and guide you into all truth but people don't have discernment they don't have direction and they don't develop that relationship your best friend on this whole earth ought to be the Holy Ghost you ought to desire to know as much about the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost knows about you and he's God he knows the very number of hairs on your head and he knows every thought he knows everything in your heart which you can't even know because your heart's deceitfully wicked and no man can know it he knows you inside and out. How well do you know Him? Because He was your guide. He was your friend that sticketh closer than a brother that God gave you so that you could know not only salvation, but come to know Christ in salvation. You don't just know Him as Savior. You know Him as a brother. And the more you know about Him, guess what's going to happen? The more time you're going to spend around Him. And then you get compounding interest. The more you put in, the more you get out, and the more you'll want to know. But, the person of the Holy Ghost, 
we have the preserved Word of God. But we also get a picture of what's to come. Anybody ever have a teacher? I hated these teachers, Brother Tommy. Because I'm convinced that they did it on purpose so that they could give everybody bad grades. But I shall explain my logic in one moment. But anybody ever have a teacher that says, well, hey, what's the test this Friday going to be on? We'll just study everything because it could be on anything. How about no, because I already took a test on some of that stuff and proved I knew it back then. The test should be on stuff I haven't been tested on yet. Right? That's because I was lazy and I was going to cram the night before the test anyway. Right? I got pretty good memory anyway. But the kicker is when they put something on the test that they never talked about in class. Right? You had no idea what was coming. And then I hated the teachers that would give you the study guide for the and it was everything that was going to be on the test because they wanted to pad the, the numbers and make them look like, oh, I'm such a great teacher because everybody got good grades. Hogwash. You basically gave them a cheat sheet. Right? Two sides of the same coin. Either you know exactly what's coming or you have no idea what's coming. But when you have no idea what's coming, it's a very overwhelming thing. We've already said no man knows what the day brings for there are some people that that drives them nuts. They have to have their whole day accounted for before it even starts. They need to be in control of every aspect, or perceive that they're in control of every aspect of their life, or else it'll cause some switch in their brain to flip and they'll end up down at the loony bin. Right? They, it'll just cause them to go into a mental break. They'll go insane. Because for, they can't wrap their head around the idea of them not being able to control the things that are in their life. Well, go out and tell the lightning to strike. And once you get that, then you can be in charge of your own life. Go out and tell the wind which way it's going to blow next. And then once it actually listens, then we'll talk. But all we have is a fantasy of being in control of our lives. You have no idea what's coming up next. But yet God does. In fact, God gave you some insight into what's coming up next. He told you that in the end times, perilous times would come. Perilous is not a bad day. Peril is the worst day that you've ever had. And then put more on top of it. He told you what's coming. It's bad. But He also told you what's coming on the other side is much worth it. We don't know much about it, but we know enough. How much do we know? What God wants you to know. Go back and see two points ago. What God preserved for you to know. I know that it's a city that's got 12 foundations. Each one of them a precious gem. I know it's got gates that are made out of a single pearl. Well, how in the world that happened? He's God. Don't worry about it. Then Think about this, Seth. He said he's the light of the city. Well, it says that there are many houses, there are many mansions. You go study it out. It says that the city's this big by this big. And then it tells you how tall the wall is, but then the city's like a hundred times taller than the wall is. So he's not talking about the wall around the city. He's saying the city is that tall. In fact, if I remember, I did the math one time, roughly, because we don't know what a, a cubit or all the measurements were that they exactly used back then, because a cubit was from here to here, and it was different from me to you. But anyway, what we do know, it's about as tall as Boeing jet craft fly. But then he says he's the light of the city. Well, if the city's that tall, in my mind, Brother Ron, that means that there's houses stacked up that high. But he says everywhere you go, there is no darkness because he is the light. Well, we know that the streets are made out of gold. What do you make the houses out of? I don't know. But we know that it's purest gold, the streets are, so that you can see right through it. I think God made all of your houses out of pure gold so that wherever you are, you can look and still see them perfectly. You say, prove that. Can't. Haven't been there yet. But I think that's what's going to happen. But if that isn't it, He did it a whole lot better than what my brain can come up with. I'll be satisfied. But there's no dark corner in heaven because He's the light of the city. 
I know what's coming. I know one day I'm going to come back with him on white horses. I know he's going to land on the Mount of Olives, split it in half. That the armies that have been brought, come out around Israel to finally destroy him, that they're all going to be wiped off the face of the earth with what? A sword that proceeds out of his mouth. He's going to say, leave them alone and they're all going to die. And it's not going to be a few people because it says the blood's going to come up to the horse's bridle down there in the valley of Megiddo. We know how it ends. Well, see, I hated the teachers that did it the one way. But it's always easy when the teacher says, here's what the final test is going to be. You got one class to remember as much of it as you can. And then when we come back next time, the test is going to be right here. Take notes. Take a photo of it with your phone. Take it with you. You can't leave here with it, but you can take as much of it with you as you can. But what do you think this is? He says, I know exactly what's coming. Do I know every curve in the road? No. We've got a picture of it. I've got enough to know that it's going to be worth it on the other side. That regardless of what I face, it's going to be worth it. Regardless of what people say about me, regardless of what I have to go through, what I have to give up, and really it's not what I have to give up, it's what we choose to give up to stay where we are close to Him. But all those things that I forsook because I wanted Jesus more, it's going to be worth it. And there are going to be hard times. But He's greater than any hardness that we'll ever face. He's stronger than any foe that can come against us. And... To go back to one of them promises, if God be for us, who can be against us? But how do you ensure that God's on your side? Get a little bit of discernment and let the Holy Ghost show you where you need to be and then get there. Remind me, Lord, of those things that I once knew but I've neglected in my life. I don't want any of them foxes getting into the vineyard and spoiling the vines. I want to make up the hedge. I want to stand in the gap because what you've given me is worth protecting. It's worth holding on to. It's worth not throwing away to the world. I'll remind you, it's not meat. Give the masters food to the dogs. It's not right for you to take what God's given you and then waste it in the world. God gave it to you for a reason. Because He knew that you would need it. Because He has seen what a day brings forth. He knows what you're going to encounter. And He's given you everything that you need to be prepared for it. He loadeth you with benefits every day. He gives you so much that if you really understood it, all we'd ever do is crawl into this altar every day and weep in appreciation of what God has done for us. What He's made available to us. What really, when God looks at us, if we could see us how He sees us, we'd live different. But see, when I get in here, I see how filthy and how wretched this flesh is. But I also see how pure and how righteous and how perfect the work that He did in me was. If somebody tells you or if you tell yourself that you're a failure and you're never amount to anything, you won't if you listen to them. But if you let the Holy Ghost tell you that God loves you, that you're special, and that if you were the only one who would have believed in Him, that Jesus still would have died that death that He died just for you then you understand that you are worth something. And if you're worth something, you want to be all that you can be, as the army would say. Can't do it on your own. But he told you right here how to be a vessel of honor. How to heap to yourselves crowns that one day you might be able to place them at the Lord's feet and say, I did it all for you. That God would look at you and he'd find favor in your life. That you could go out and be a witness, a jewel to the world. That by you, some might come to the saving knowledge of Christ. That you could be used as an instrument for God, for God's glory, and just be happy to be used of God at all. That He even knows your name. Let alone that He would choose to equip you and use you, and through you, make a difference in somebody else's life. It's a benefit to draw every breath that we take. It's a benefit to take every step that we take, but God blesses us with so much more. He didn't give it to you so that it would go by the wayside. 
He gave it to you so that you would use it. Because it is of a benefit to you. That's it. Done, Dad. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.